393, yeah. All right, it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Appreciate everyone able to come out and be with us. And if you uh, if, if if you sing in the choir or you want to sing in the choir, uh, and you want to be notified early as to the songs, uh, then make sure you get with either uh, uh, Heather Barnhart or or um, uh, Mackenzie. Okay because they're helping me do that now, and they're sending them out early, so when you come in on Sunday, we're just trying to do everything decently in order. We're not going by a menu. That's not to say if we get in here and start singing, and the Holy Spirit decides that we need to sing another song, I'll, man, I'll change gears right in the middle of the stream. But what I'm saying is, it's, it, it's, it would it's, make things more orderly, when you come to the choir, if you know what book to bring and you know what we're going to sing. So if you'll get your information uh, to, to one of either Heather or Mackenzie, then they'll make sure that you get a text and you'll know what we're going to be doing. And, uh, and like I say, it's not a menu. Uh, it's something to go by. And uh, if the Holy Spirit moves in, um, somebody said we, we'll even do jingle bells. Where's Mackenzie? I got, I, she's up there? Yeah, she couldn't hear me. Okay. All right, let's take the church home tonight and, and uh, turn to page number 393. 393, when we all get to heaven. Yeah. 
folks. Good to be here. All right. Sister McLeod's going to sing for us. If we can't uh, get her up here. Well, if you all know this or not, we both went to the same high school and they tore our high school down. <laughs> came into my heart 62 years ago and uh, that's always special to me more than anything else and uh, I couldn't do without him uh, I don't know how anybody could walk away from me I just I just I love him with all my heart <laughs> I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do No one ever cared for me like Jesus There's no other friend so kind as he No one else could take the sin and darkness from me Oh how much he cared for me All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me was full of misery and woe. Jesus came and placed his loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. sin and darkness from me oh how much he cared for me every day he comes to me with new assurance more and more I understand his words of love but I'll never know just why he came to say I do. I like that. I've always liked that song. Well, folks, if you have your Bible, turn to the Gospel of John, chapter number 6, and verse number 70. John, chapter 6, and verse number 70. Here's what the Lord said. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? Father, bless your word tonight. Lord, add your unction to it and your blessing to it, and use it for the purpose that you intended. 
In the holy name, amen. All right, you folks can be seated. Now, the devil, of course, he's referring to is Judas Iscariot. His name is Iscariot, Ishkirath is what his name is in Hebrew. Ish means man, Isha is woman. So Ishkariot means a man of Kirath. So this man was a devil from the beginning. So why did the Lord Jesus choose a devil? Well, that gets into the divine counsel and his purpose. But I'm going to deal with it not from that perspective tonight. I just want to try to show you something else that's going on with this. But if you notice carefully, never in the Bible is Judas Iscariot cast in a good light. Never, not one time. For example, look at John chapter 12 and verse number 6. In John 12, 6, Scripture says, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Do you remember the context of this, why this was brought about, why this was... Uh, did not he say, that, what meaneth this waste? Could not this have been taken and given to the poor? What had happened? Somebody had done something. It anointed him with very expensive, very expensive, and said it could be given to the poor. Here's what he said about the poor. He said, you'll always have the poor with you. And that's quite a revealing statement itself. But if you notice carefully, the scripture says that he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Now, in John chapter number 13 and verse number 27, Judas Iscariot continues progressively downward in his spiral. In John chapter 13, verse 27, And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Now, note carefully now. In John chapter number 6 and verse 70, he said, One of you is a devil, Diablos. But then we have... In John chapter 13, verse 27, the devil himself entering into Judas. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest too quickly. So uh, Satan is, is an opportunist. He always has been, always will be. He seeks whom he may devour. And the case of Judas Iscariot, he was not born condemned. If he was born condemned, then that, my friend, is what we call uh, election those who believe that there are certain groups elected for hell and have no choice no matter. I don't believe that. But Judas Iscariot made his choices, and the scripture here has not set him in a good light, set him in a bad light, because here he betrays treachery, our Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 3, the Bible says, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. A lot can be said about the innocent blood that we're dealing with here. But that's not the lesson tonight. But it looks to me like Judas Iscariot has had a spiritual awakening, an understanding of the gravity of what he's done. I mean, he's a thief on one hand, yes, but we go much further. This is much, much deeper and much further than simply being a thief because now he has betrayed through treachery the Son of God. And he says, I have betrayed the innocent blood. Now, there's only one righteous one and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost as if he's saying, uh, I have been shown from God that the one that I betrayed is far, far more than I ever thought he was. And of course he is. The scripture says that he repented himself. And uh, this repentance, you know, you might say, well, a man repents because of uh, damage control. You could say that. But I'm not so sure what's going on here. But I do know this. I do know he was condemned. And the scripture tells you plainly that he went out in chapter number 27 and verse number 5. He cast down the pieces of silver in the temple, departed, and went and hanged himself. The apostles in the book of Acts chapter 1 said he went to his own place. So Judas Iscariot is condemned. And in my estimation, he has no hope 
condemned to damnation. That's the only thing I can figure from what happened to Judas Iscariot. Some say the spirit of the Antichrist, when he shows up, will be the spirit of Judas Iscariot resurrected, brought forth to uh, enter into a man. Uh, this tonight, though, I want to show you how that if, having read these scriptures, is there anything good you can say about Judas Iscariot? Of course not. There's nothing good, there's nothing good ever said about him. He, he is a deceiver, a liar, a thief, and he's guilty of treachery. Amen. And uh, it's the kind of thing that, uh, that would turn you against someone. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the gospel of Judas Iscariot? Well, Grant, some of you have. All right. It's an interesting document. How many has ever heard of Irenaeus, one of the church fathers? He, about 180 A.D., and right after the completion of the canon of Scripture, uh, began a series of, of uh, works called Against Heresies. Irenaeus was dealing with Gnosticism and other things that began to develop in the first century after Christ. Remember this now. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, had already been written. The canon of Scripture was closed about 90, 95 A.D., the latest 100 A.D., somewhere in there. The canon of Scripture was closed. That means that the inspired Word of God was finished. Now, that, doesn't, that didn't mean that they didn't continue to write. Oh, yes, they, start, they continued to write, but not the apostles. We have what's called pseudepigraphic writings. We have Gnostic Gospels. We have apocryphal writings, Christian Apocrypha, Jewish Apocrypha, and all this. But what you have now is a man who has lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth, this man has been crucified on a cross, was buried, and rose again the third day, 40 days later, ascended to heaven. His disciples, his apostles, went out and began to preach his word all over the place, and they were writing scripture. Now, once the scripture was written, in comes the perverts, the liars, the deceivers, uh, the ones who began to write this stuff that tries to change the identity and nature of who Christ is. And that's what's important about what I'm talking about tonight. One of the documents written according to Irenaeus about 180 A.D. Now that's not long after the completion of the canon, folks. 180 A.D. By the way, I'll just mention this while I'm at it. Church fathers come in three sizes. Apostolic, like Polycarp, who lived in a time he was a di di direct disciple of the Apostle John. These are apostolic fathers. Anti-Nicene fathers who lived before the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. And then post-Nicene fathers who lived after the Council of Nicaea in 325 A.D. These are called the fathers of the church. Now this is what they're called. And uh, you know this is something that's there. It's out there. It's been out there for a long time. And you can, you can do this. You can do your own research into it. Some of them were really pretty good men. And some of them were apostates. So you have to deal with it on this case-by-case -case study, uh, essentially like you do with anything. Irenaeus was a believer. There's no question about that. And he was defending. He was, he was, an, he was, he was an apologist, okay? An apologist is someone who defends the faith. And he went against heresies. Now look at, look at this. In 180 A.D., he mentions a gospel of Judas. And lo and behold... Uh, not too many years passed, they discovered this gospel of Judas. No one knew that it even existed apart from what Irenaeus had said. And lo and behold, it pops up. It's in existence. It's extant. Now, on the face of it, it's very important to understand this. Here's something that was said in 180 A.D. that has been proven historically accurate. Because you've got that. It exists. I don't appreciate a thing that's said in it, but the bottom line is it was mentioned and it's in, it's in it, you know, it exists. I don't believe I have to prove to anybody tonight that the scripture is inspired. I believe you all believe it's inspired. I believe you all believe that, that, uh, that the apostles wrote the Bible. And uh, no question about that. But there are those out there listening who don't know. And they doubt it. And they say, well, just men just wrote the Bible. That's a hard one for them to deal with there in 180 A.D. because Gnosticism had already begun to take its roots. Gnosticism had already begun to change the truth of who Christ was. Now, in 1947, in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, 
They discovered what's called the Gnostic Gospels. And I've mentioned them to you many times, all right? But this one was not included in that group. And these Gnostic Gospels, according to some of the scholars today, and I seldom ever use the word scholar, uh, they get too much credit. If a man doesn't have a half a brain, I don't know if you ought to call him a scholar or not. Do you think about that? But anyway, uh, they, uh, they say that, uh, that men like Irenaeus and Polycarp and the early church father and so forth uh, created a orthodox type of Christianity and that, uh, and that the real Christianity of Christ 2,000 years ago was really that that's preached by the Gnostics. And that what you've got in your hands here is just something that's, uh, that was essentially uh, man created it. And of course, when you get into this, you have to understand, when they start talking like this, they are attacking your Bible. When they attack the Apostle Paul and tell you that he, uh, you know, that, 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 that he changed the gospel that Christ preached. To, when he, Christ was here, he preached the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And they say when Paul came out with all of his epistles, he changed that gospel. So what have they done? They've attacked the Bible. They have, how many have ever heard them say that the God of the Old Testament, and they, they like to call him Yahweh now, and instead of Jehovah, and the God of the Old Testament was a mean, vindictive, hateful, a murderous, bloodlusting God. How many's ever heard? How many's ever heard that? All right, you're going to hear it if you do any reading or listen to a certain crowd. You're going to hear that. And then, of course, what they've done is assault the Old Testament scriptures. Once they get done with it, you don't have a Bible left, right? You don't have a Bible. The Gnostics teach that the God of the Old Testament was a demiurge. So what are we talking about now? We're talking about classic Gnosticism. Now let me say this at the beginning of it. Gnosticism, Gnostics don't even agree among themselves. How many has ever heard of the Sabian Mandians? I mentioned to them, I mentioned them to you a few months ago. Remember over there in the Euphrates River? They were baptizing. They baptize every time they meet. The Sabian Mandians are direct followers of John the Baptist, you see. They say that John the Baptist was the one who continued the true gospel. And that when Jesus Christ showed up 2,000 years ago, he perverted the true gospel. And so they're not Christians, of course. They're following John the Baptist. And of course, the John the Baptist of the New Testament preached Christ. You and I both know that. You've got a Bible in your hands. But anyway, I'm trying to show you what's going on out here because we're dealing with it now because you see, here's what's happened. When the internet opened up and uh, Wikipedia and these other uh, information sources, people have access now to every kind of perversion that's ever been written. It's out there and a lot of these people are reading this stuff and they won't darken a church door. They won't go to church and they become in their own estimation, scholars. And they'll argue with you long, night and day about who Christ was. You have what's called a low Christology and a high Christology. What's that? A low Christology is a feel-good church where you go in there and they tell you how good you are and all the great blessings God has for you and that Christ came into the world. It's not so much the identity of who he really was. It's what he can do for you. And so a low Christology has to do with the fact, well, this man 2,000 years ago, whether he was real or not, really doesn't make any difference. He laid down some good teachings for us and showed us how that we can be prosperous in this life. And so that's a low Christology. Or you can have a high Christology. And what is that? Well, let me read it for you. Because I belong to that crowd. You'd figure that, wouldn't you? High Christology says like this, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty, El Shaddai. Now that's high Christology. The Gospel of John, chapter number 8 and verse number 58, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. That's high Christology. He identifies himself with the Jehovah of the Old Testament. In Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven 
that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That's high Christology. What does that say? That says that he is the almighty creator that holds everything together, and it was all made for his pleasure and his glory. He who? Well, in 1 Timothy 3.16, here's if you've got the right Bible, here's what your Bible says. In without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Now, of course, many of the new Bibles have changed he from God to he who was manifest in the flesh. And as I remind you again, and this is important, it took me years to understand this concept. Uh, you know, you don't take somebody off of Hey Boy Corner and take them into open heart surgery and put a mask on them and stand them next to you and say, now when I need you, I'll call for you. And you hand me what I need. And he doesn't have a clue what he's hand. He doesn't know what these instruments are. He doesn't know what he's plugged up to. He doesn't know anything. Yet he's willing to stand there and be part of a open heart surgery. And there he is. And then when it's over with, he goes out and tells people, well, I just performed my first surgery. I was in there with a doctor. That's what you sound like if you've never had manuscript evidence. I don't want to be mean, but I want to be blunt. Before you jump up and start jerking passages out of the Bible and changing the meaning of these words, you'd better know what you're talking about. Because the people sitting out there in the pew, they don't know Greek and Hebrew. They don't have to know Greek and Hebrew. But they do need to know that the Bible they've got in their hands is God's word and they can believe it. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot of different reasons for people doing that. But it angers me. You know why it angers me? Because I started out listening to these people. And I started, I got 15 or 20 different Bible translations. Got everything. Well, this one sounds better. It's easier to understand. I didn't know anything about manuscript evidence. Didn't know anything about any of it. But there's a thing called Nestle Allen's Critical Apparatus. Okay? It's a little book about that thick, about that wide, about that high. Now, if you don't know what that is tonight, that's okay. But if you're a Bible corrector out there and you're telling people that this is a mistranslation or it doesn't belong in the Bible and you don't know what that is, you've made a fool out of yourself. Are you following? You, are you get the logic? You'd better know what the Nestle Allen critical apparatus is before you start jerking passages out. Well, my teacher, I don't care what your teacher taught you. I don't care what your school says. Do you know what you're doing? So maybe by saying all of that tonight, I might help somebody to get you back in there and let you do a little research on your own. And you'll find out that for every verse in the Bible, every word in Scripture, these Germans put down at the bottom of the page all of the manuscript support for that word, that verse. It's in there, every bit of it. And it identifies all of the material that's available as to whether it should be in there or not in there or uncertain. See, that's how you read that Nestle Allen critical apparatus. And if you don't know how to read that, then you have no business. You know, listening, well, the teacher says this. Some of these guys will get a hold of some teacher, some, you know, professor, and that's it. From then on, he's their God because anything he says, they say, whatever he says is wrong, it's wrong. Uh, you know, if it doesn't belong in the Bible, it doesn't belong in the Bible. Well, my professor said it didn't. And then from then on, then you're nothing in the world more than a mouthpiece for him. This will help you, folks. It'll help you, and you can get this material, and it's available. And uh, of course, it it, uh, it you you have to learn how to use it and get into it. Now, let me say this: after saying all of that, I've checked. I don't. Know, Lord only knows how many mistranslations of the New Testament. You know, with Nestle Allen. I mean, go straight to the thing. You know, checked them. The mistranslations of the Bible. Places where whole passages are missing. 
1 John 5, 7, Johannine comma. You know, the last few verses of Mark chapter 16. Places in the Bible like that. 1 Timothy 3, 16, where they change it from God to he who. And Revelation 1, 5, where it says, he hath loosed us from our sins in his own blood instead of washed us from our sin. Go check them. I've gone to check them. I've checked them out. And you know what I've found in every single case? I've found in every single case that the King James Bible that I've got in my hand can be supported by that text. Yeah, I have. I found it. It's, it can be supported from that text. And so the end of your ministry or the product or the fruit of your ministry with people is that either you walk out of this house today and you'll walk out of here tonight and you'll say to yourself, well, you know, there's a lot of things I don't understand, a lot of things I, you know, that a little over my head and they're over my head too, but I still believe my Bible and I believe my Bible is inspired and I don't believe my Bible's full of errors then I have accomplished my ministry. I've done something worthwhile. But if you leave out of here tonight and you say, well, you know, that preacher said this shouldn't be in there and, and that this is a mistranslation and that it'll all be Yahweh now instead of Jehovah and on and on and on and on and on it goes, what have I done? Here's what I've done. I've sown confusion. And we have so many people today that are confused. Now the Bible, does, the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. If he's not, who is? <laughs> If there's anyone, if there's, a, if there's a creature that would want you to doubt the Bible, mess you up in Scripture, uh, cause confusion in your heart, who do you think it'd be? Well, it'd be the devil. The first time he shows up, he said, Yea, hath God said. That's right. So it, it's the same thing with Judas Iscariot. It's the King James Bible, a Bible like I've got in my hands right here, inspired Scripture, has nothing good to say about Judas. Not a word. Yet, you're going to get into stuff today where they are bragging about Judas. The Gnostics teach that Judas had a divine from the noose or from the mind, the emanation of this, of this eternal mind, uh, that he had this understanding that Christ had to get rid of his body. He had to get rid of it because the body's physical and it's, and it's, and it's evil. And so he helped him to the crucifixion and therefore became a hero. Now, you're following with me here. This is Gnosticism. All right. If you, have, if, you, if you don't believe this King James Bible and you don't believe it's inspired in the Word of God, then you're left out there in the lurch and you're ready to run any rabbit that shows up. And that's one of them right there. They've made Judas into a hero. They've made him into a hero if you don't have absolute, complete confidence in the Bible that you have in your hands. See how it works? The scriptures are important. They are so very important. So this gospel of Judas Iscariot, of course, is no gospel, and it's, it's a lying a fabrication. It has, it has no connection with the Judas of the Bible, of the scripture, of history. It's a, it's a, it's a man-made 2,000 years ago, 180 years after Christ, Gnostic form of Christ. Now, Gnosticism was not new, 180 AD. It simply took on a new garb. It took on a new form. The idea that you had this noose, this mind, the demiurge, archons, avatar. How many ever heard of an avatar? You know what an avatar is? An avatar is a manifestation of a Hindu god. All right? When CERN was built, do you know what they've got in front of CERN? They've got Shiva dancing the Nataraj. What's the Nataraj? The Nataraj is this, is this sim, symbolic idea of destruction and recreation. So the point is that at CERN, we are going to destroy what we know in order to create something new. We're going to cross over. We're going to bang these two things together and what comes out of it is going to lead us into a new world of understanding. And they even said themselves, one of their spokespersons said, uh, we're going to go and we don't know what's going to be there when we open that door. We don't know where we're going into or what's coming out of it. But we're going anyway. And that's kind of stupid and foolish in my book. Amen. But anyway, that's what they're doing. Okay. But what you do to prepare people for that is to cause them to doubt their faith in the Word of God. When I, was in, when I first got saved in 1973, 
uh, I heard, I, I, it was so rare back then. Preachers didn't get up in the pulpit and talk about mistranslations, whole sections of the Bible uh, to be jerked out. They preached it and believed it, and the people that I went to church with believed the Bible. Uh, it was, it was just, that was just Christianity back then. But today, there's every kind of uh, deviation from the truth that you can imagine. And this is where we're getting. And this is the new Christ. This is the new Christ. And the new Christ is going to be the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is going to lead them into a... Uh, into a deception to cause them to receive a mark. And when they receive that mark, folks, uh, it's damnation. Revelation 14, if they receive the mark, damnation. Damnation. Don't do it. Don't do it. If you're listening to me, don't receive that mark. Now, here we go. How do you confuse people? Here's how you confuse people. You confuse people by telling them that by going to church on Sunday is the mark of the beast. Have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. Uh, you confuse them by telling them that if you have, if you have, uh, if you have, uh, if you have any kind of, a, of electronic uh, media where you are connected with 666, and there's a number of ways you can be, then you've got the mark of the beast. Uh, I don't know. There may be even some out there who believe that if you believe the earth is round and not flat, then you've got to... You, you, you got the mark of the beast and uh, everything everything you can imagine you wouldn't believe uh, how many how many different deviations but let me say this tonight when the beast shows up and he will show up then he will have a mark it'll be his mark and it'll be his mark connected with him and until he shows up it's all speculation as to what the mark of the beast is. And when he shows up, he'll have a name, and the number of his name will be hex, 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 six, six, six. That'll be the number of his name. When he shows up, he'll have a name, he'll have a mark. He'll have a number. And you'll know him, Revelation 13, if you're not one of the Lord's. But we are going to leave here when, before that happens. Man, but I can see it coming. I can see it coming. All right, well, the new religion in America is uh, God and country and a fifth of liquor. How many of you have seen that? Yeah, how many of you have seen what I'm talking about? God, country, that's all good. I'm all for God and all for country. And then this is our whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Watch it, folks. You can get along just fine without whiskey. So when did that become part of your faith? Amen. But see how they, see what they've done? They have, watch them, watch them. I don't want to get myself in trouble tonight, but be careful. A high Christology will keep you out of trouble. You exalt the Lord Jesus where he belongs. Way above everything. It's all about him. And that'll keep you out of trouble. Your eschatology can be messed up. Your poly church polity can be messed up. Uh, you, your, your, uh, 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 you know, the offices in the church and stuff like that can be all messed up. You can be messed up on the Ten Commandments. You can be messed up on a lot of things and squeak by. But when you get messed up on Christ, there's no squeaking by. If you don't get him right, you're in trouble. Father, bless your word tonight. We thank you for the time in your house. I pray you'd bless what I've said. And Father, I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, you'd open some eyes and hearts that they may understand this. And instead of getting mad, get a hold of something and do a little digging for their own and find out what's really going on. In your holy name, amen. All right, well, take a, a prayer request. Anybody have a request tonight? brother's back from florida we're glad to have him back amen yes sir thank you uh please uh remember to keep sister peacock in your in your prayers uh, saw her all last week she's gone through chemo and she's very weak 
and uh, just pray for her that uh, God would heal her and pray for my oldest daughter Faith please Amen all right, brother. Please, please remember my sister, Ginger Price. Uh, she's going to have a procedure done Friday, and I'm real concerned over it. I appreciate everybody praying for her. Yes, ma'am. All right. Amen. All right, buddy. else? Down here on the front. Lady over here. Um, I want to pray for one of my clients. Her name's Mitzi Chrislip. Um, she's going through a really, really hard time, and her husband is having some really severe health conditions right now. Um, so you talk to a lot of people um, that are just facing a lot of sickness and problems. So I um, just want to take a moment. I hope she's watching tonight. I invited her to watch online. So she's um, in a different state, but thank you. All right, amen. Okay. Sister Crane down here on the front, I think she had a prayer request. Uh, we have a niece named Tanya. She has uh, bad diabetes, and they uh, diagnosed her with an eye disease connected with her. Uh, diabetes and said she could lose her sight within a two year span. You know, remember to pray for her and remember us on Friday. Ronnie will be at the hospital all day. Him getting different scans that they're needing, that everything will show what the issue is with him at the moment. All right. I appreciate Amen. the prayer. Okay. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Martha. Um, I spoke with one of my friends today. She's in St. Croix and um, she's kind of broken hearted. She's about to lose her house because of the bad economy. And um, please pray for her. She's, um, she's having a tough time. The work that she does is limited. And she wasn't able to um, keep up with her contract and so she's not even sure if she'll get her money back for what she's already put in. And so um, she's, yeah, please pray for her. Her name is Lorna. All right. Amen. The economy's hurt a lot of people. A lot of people. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, yeah. Brother, well. Yes, sir. I, I want to say something real quick. I, you know, I don't normally do this, but I want to brag on the Lord for a minute. You, you're, you're talking about that our, the Word of God and it being, it being without error from cover to cover. Yeah. I've I got to give testimony to the Lord. As a young Christian right here 25, 30 years ago, sitting on Brother Lawson, under Brother Lawson, I was really, really confused about the Word of God. And, I, I, I want, and I'm, I'm cynical by nature. And I, I, I wanted to believe that it was without error. I really wanted to. But, but me being cynical like I was, I just, I was so miserable. And I'll never forget the night, Brother Barry, you was with me. I'll never forget the night I came down here to the altar. And I laid that Bible, brother, on the altar. And I told the Lord, I said, I'm not getting up until this thing's settled. Till you, you show me if this is your word. If it is without air from cover, or it's not, but I'm not getting up. I can't keep living like this. Amen. And man, he settled it right there, brother. Amen. And it's not something that I can do. And and that was 25, 30 years ago. And I I'm, I can't tell you. It's just like you know, me knowing what the color blue is and the color red. It's it's settled. And I I thank the Lord for that. And and if there's any of you that are struggling, I know the Lord could do the same thing for you. Yes, He can. I just wanted to brag on the Lord. Amen, brother. You can, but that's you did the right thing. You brought it to the Lord. Yes. Yes. On that note, uh, ten years ago, I was riding with Paul, and I had a King James Bible, and I wasn't saved. But he had showed me that how when he was in college, and he had an NIV, and and one of his buddies had 
played a little trick on him and said, you know, we'll go to First John 5, 7. Of course, you know, it says, for there are three that bear record. Then it skips to the, to the next, to, to verse 8. Yeah. And he told me that story, and I didn't know that. I didn't know anything about the Bible. And as soon as he showed me that, that First John 5, 7 had been messed with, well, before I knew anything about manuscript evidence or Greek or any of that stuff, I knew right then, I said, well, there's something wrong with that. And so it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out when you take verses out of the Bible, there's something wrong with that. Yeah, you got a problem. Uh, and of course, all the other ones, and, and we, we go on about that. But just like Brother Sean said, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's the truth or it's not. Right. And so the Lord right. had showed me, and then I, later on I wound up getting saved. And I thank God for Paul showing me that because I, he, it put me on the right path and kept me on the right path. Without yeah. knowing anything else, just that, that was enough. So. Amen. I just want to say that. Amen. Amen. I had a man stand right down here, right in there, oh, about three weeks ago. I think he was from Indiana, Ohio, or somewhere, from uh, some folks outside. He said, Preacher, he said, I used to follow and run after every translation you can imagine. He said, but the King James Bible talks to me. <laughs> That's all he had to say. Amen. He said, it talks to me. I said, yeah, it talks to you because you've got God's word in your hand. That's why it talks to you. Amen. All right. Okay, anybody else? Well, thank you for listening. Lord bless you. We've got Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up. Pray for me and pray for our church. The Lord's been good to us, folks. He's blessed his temple. Yes, he has. He's brought such a good spirit in here. I'm so thankful for that. You wouldn't believe. Amen. <laughs> Uh, the, the spirit's everything. That's your life, and uh, it is. It's it's everything. Uh, and so, just keep praying for Temple. I've, God talks to me. A guy commented the other day, underneath one of the messages there. I, I try to read most of them, and I do a lot of praying. My my my! You wouldn't believe the prayers. You start reading these comments, and, and you'll pray. You will, because some of those poor folks, they they're in desperate need. Uh, but one. Uh, <laughs> One, one person said, uh, well, when God finished the Bible, that's it. He doesn't talk to us anymore. And I thought to myself, well, now, <clears throat> uh, when you were lost without God and you were, you know, lost, and, and then you got convicted, right? I didn't talk to him, of course. This is theoretical. Uh, who convicted you? Uh, what did he say to you? <laughs> Are you listening? Yeah, he did. It's the Almighty began to speak to my soul before I ever knew him. You tell me he can't speak to you today? And this like that thing I had this battle with a demon over there in the Kidron Valley. Oh, you wouldn't believe. Uh, some of them, I no doubt think, man, you got yourself a nutball over there for a pastor. But then there's a number of them in there that said, I've had the same thing that's happened to me. And here's why it's good to do this. Because a lot of people are scared to death to say anything. They're afraid they'll be ridiculed. And it holds them back. It just it, Satan beats them to death with it. If you're out there and you've had an encounter with a demon, you'll never forget it. Here's one preacher that has had an encounter with a demon. And I know exactly what it's like. Exactly what it's like. You better believe it. And it can't be taken from me. I know what happened in the Kidron Valley. I know what happened on that back porch. I know what happened. 1973, I bowed my head and I prayed. And when I raised my head up, I was no longer in that world. I was in a new world. And, you know, you can't take that away from you. And so you try to help people and minister to them like that. And it'll help you. So if you've had an encounter with a demon, you, maybe God wants you to say it to someone or tell the church. I don't know. But, but be careful. Don't let people, don't let people intimidate you and, and, and just... Lord it over you. Don't let that happen. If God wants you to say it, say something when you say it. And God will bless you for it. Amen. Father, I thank you for the prayer request tonight, for those that are watching. Thank you, Father. We've got live streaming back up now, and the folks are watching and commenting. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful, Father, for it's recorded, and it'll be archived, and they can play it again later. Thankful for that. But Heavenly Father, the most important thing about all this tonight is that your word is alive. It has gone out. A living word has gone into the hearts of these people. 
They may not realize it while it's happening, but if they've listened and they believe it, they've taken, they've taken something alive into, them, into their soul, and it will bring forth fruit in due time. It will do what you intend for it to do, and all the gates of hell can't stop it. Lord, I pray that I would help their faith, help build their faith, increase their love for our Lord Jesus Christ, point them in the right direction, point them away from me. I'm nothing but a messenger, and point them to the Son of God, and point them to the fact they can hold a Bible in their hands and believe it from cover to cover, stand on it, confess it, memorize it, and trust it as your infallible word. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, folks. Amen. We'll meet again Sunday, Lord willing. <laughs>